I didn't even realize it was a thing for your particular situation um, that you were sentenced and then you lived free for six years, mm -hmm. um, knowing that you eventually had to go to prison. How common is that situation? It's pretty unusual to spend six years on pretrial, basically that's the status. Um, it's also unusual, you know, most people who are accused of a crime in this country are too poor to afford a lawyer. You know, 80% of people who are accused of a crime will need a public defender or another court-appointed lawyer. I was a lot more fortunate than most of the people that go through the criminal justice system and most of the women I was incarcerated with. So I was free on bail. Um, you know, so it, it is unusual. It's unusual for a, a period of time that long. Uh, and it's also unusual to sort of be free on bail during that period of time. And what was that like? I know in your book you described it, I mean, clearly like, incredibly stressful and then, like slowly breaking the news to your friends. Like, mm -hmm. so was that, if you could go back, would you have rather gone to prison like sooner, or was that six years a good thing? I mean, by the time the six years were over, I was pretty ready to get the whole thing mm -hmm. over with. So uh, on some strange level, I entered prison like, all right, let's get this over with. Um, you know, it's a lot like being in limbo, yeah. right? So unusual, but, uh, but again, so many of the women that I did time with sir, you know, faced much harsher penalties than what I experienced. You know, in the end, I received a 15-month sentence, which is a relatively short sentence. So that was very um, fortunate. Were there women um, serving like longer amounts of time for similar crimes? Many, yes. A huge number of women were serving much longer sentences for very similar offenses. Um, Two-thirds of all women who are incarcerated are incarcerated for drug offenses or for property crimes, not for the most serious violent crimes that concern us. And in the federal system, that's even more true. Almost all women who are incarcerated in the federal system are there for a drug offense or for you know, a fraud conviction or some other kind of a property crime. And the only thing that separates those sentences are the, you know, the background that they come from and whether or not they can afford a lawyer to get those shorter sentences? Absolutely. Socioeconomics uh, are a huge predictor of what kind of outcome someone will get in the criminal justice system, whether they'll be charged with a crime at all in the first place, and if they are, you know, what the prosecutor will do with them and, and what kind of sentence they receive. The data shows us very clearly that race and socioeconomic status make a huge difference. And that question of, you know, representation, you know, how you will be represented in court, who you will be represented by, um, is very, very important. So, um, and unfortunately, you know, it means that two Americans cannot count on being treated in the same way in the criminal justice system, which is our expectation under law. Right. To talk about the show for a second. Mm -hmm. First of all, I was just wondering what it was like working with Genji Cohen. I'm like a big fan of Weeds. Mm -hmm. So that was like, mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool that she worked on your show too. Um, how much of the show's adaptation is true to your actual experience? So I was thrilled that somebody as talented and creative and provocative as Genji Cohan wanted to adapt the book. Um, it's very fortunate. Um, she's great, you know, she's an amazing television visionary, obviously, um, and the result of the show has been phenomenal. Um, even from the very first season, there are these huge departures from the true story that's mm -hmm. told in the book. But what's important to me is that the themes of the book, which are themes about race and class and gender and power and friendship and empathy, all of those themes are there in the show. And that's what's really important to me. Um, yeah. So why is it that the inmates live up to their um, worst racial stereotypes? That was something that I pulled out of the book. And why do you feel that that's expected of them when they're living there? Um, I don't know if it's all necessarily only a racial stereotype. I mean, uh, it's hard to imagine a situation which is more grounded in role playing than, than prison. You know, the people who operate a prison are playing a role of jailer, and obviously people who are incarcerated are playing a role of prisoner, and it's very codified, and it's very um, freighted with stereotype. And so um, you also see these incredible disparities in terms of like how different people are treated um, by the criminal justice system in terms of sentencing. And then when people are incarcerated, 
What you often see is that many prisons in this country are located in rural places, which are often predominantly white, and we see huge racial disparity in terms of who is incarcerated. So for example, here in Ohio, um, the, majority, the, the, the vast majority of people who are going into the system are coming from Cuyahoga County, from Hamilton County, from Summit County, from like urban counties, disproportionately black people being sent into the system from those districts. And they're often being sent out to prisons which are out in very rural areas of Ohio, which may in some cases be predominantly white. And so you see those divisions um, along racial lines really um, amplified by the way the system works. How did you end up in Columbus then? Like what about this prison system brought you here? Well, I first came here uh, in 2013, and I came here because the men's prison where I teach, which is Marion Correctional Institution, is the first prison in the world that ever held a TEDx talk. Oh, cool. And I sort of said, wow, I've never heard of such a thing, and I had not visited a state men's facility before, so I was eager to do so, and I was really interested by um, the men I met there and the staff that I met there, and over time, you know, I, I developed a relationship with the warden there and the warden at ORW, the Ohio Reformatory for Women. And eventually I asked if I could come and teach writing classes in those two prisons. And it's been tremendous. It's been a tremendous experience. What are the like biggest differences that you notice between, now that you've experienced um, a men's correctional facility as well, mm -hmm. uh, between that and the women's correctional facility that you were in? <sighs> so, uh, the women's facility, the Ohio Reformatory for Women, really reminds me a great deal of the prison where I was incarcerated. Um, women are overwhelmingly incarcerated for low-level offenses or, you know, not for violent offenses. And so women's prisons tend not to be these highly secure facilities. They tend to be physically spread out. There are fewer locked doors. You know, people tend not to be locked down. Um, men's facilities are more likely to be higher security facilities um, and have more controlled movement. Um, as I said, two-thirds of women are incarcerated for drug offenses or for property crimes and not for violent crimes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, is a di that creates a difference. You know, in Marion, uh, Marion Correctional Institution has more lifers than any other prison in Ohio, mm -hmm. which means that a lot of the men there are, are, have been convicted of serious offenses. Right. Despite that reality, though, it has uh, one of the lowest rates of violence mm -hmm. among all Ohio prisons. Interesting. So, you know, people assume that because someone is capable of committing a violent crime, that that means that they will be violent all the time, and that's not the case. So. What is your hope for the way that the American prison system can change to rehabilitate like drug offenders and, and people who are serving these long sentences for crimes that aren't necessarily as serious? So prisons and jails are very poor places to deal with things like substance abuse or mental health issues. Um, people who are struggling with addiction or are mentally ill or have a mental health problem do not get better in prisons and jails and actually prisons and jails can often make those folks um, worse. And so what I really hope is that we stop putting people in prison and jail whose fundamental issues are grounded in substance abuse and addiction or mental health challenges. Um, if they don't need to be there for public safety reasons, then they shouldn't be there at all. Mm -hmm. And that would really start to reduce our prison population. There's a, you know, our prisons and jails have really become dumping grounds for mentally ill people. Um, the biggest providers of mental health care in this country are the Cook County Jail in Chicago, Rikers Island in New York, and the LA County Jail in Los Angeles. They, those are the places that have the largest number of beds for mental health treatment. And that is just a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, prisons and jails need to be able to provide mental health care. That's going to be necessary. But the idea that we have lodged mental health care for poor people in the criminal justice system is an incredibly poor choice. Right. That really belongs in the community and the public health system. Yeah. So that would be an incredibly important starting point. Um, Do you see and, that happening? Um, we see a lot more discussion about it. Um, there has been, just in the, in the most recent years, 
a lot more focus on jails, county jails and city jails, and that's really important because that's where people who are in crisis um, from, you know, from mental health issues and also from substance abuse often end up first. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, the guy who's in charge of the Cook County Jail now uh, is a mental health expert, and that's oh, good. it's kind of I mean it's it's good. It's definitely a good thing um, because that's the reality. But it's also uh, it's a sad comment on us as a society. We can do far better for the people who are frankly most in need. Right. Um, you know, at the same time, we obviously have uh, an opiate crisis all over this country, and many obvious needs for dealing with substance abuse and addiction, and putting people in prison and jail immobilizes them, but it doesn't help them get better, grow, or progress. Right. Um, the last point about, you know, hope for rehabilitation is that, you know, Marion Correctional Institution was built for 14 men, and there are 2,600 men living there. Most prisons and jails are way over capacity, and when that is true, it's difficult to do anything other than maintain order in those facilities. Mm -hmm. So having people locked up who don't need to be there makes it less possible for us to rehabilitate people who really need that rehabilitation in a correctional setting. So um, there's a lot of opportunity to do things uh, better. <laughs> um, is that something that you work with? Is that what your role is um, in the Women's Prison Association? Is that something that you guys an advocacy group or what exactly do you do? The Women's Prison Association uh, has been around since 1845. It is the longest serving organization that focuses on criminal justice involved women and their families. And it's based in New York, which is where I used to live. Um, in New York City, we operate two residences because housing, access to safe housing, is a huge issue for women and girls coming out of, of prison or jail. It's a, it's a huge issue for everyone, but especially for women because that question of, of how they can be safe um, when they've been released from prison is very important. Um, we do family reunification housing, so in other words, women who may have lost custody of their children have the opportunity to begin to go down the road of regaining custody um, via that housing, so those families are able to be reunified and to live together and then eventually to, to move out to their own place. Mm -hmm. um, we're very proud of all of that work. We do work with HIV uh, and, and women who are suffering from AIDS who are coming out of the correctional system to make sure that they have continuity of care. In other words, that they don't, um, whatever health care they've, they've been able to get while they've been incarcerated, they don't completely lose any access to health care when, when they have such a significant um, health challenge. But the work that we're proudest of is the work that we do to prevent women from going into the system. So we operate um, an alternative to incarceration program called Justice Home, where a woman has been convicted of a crime and is facing at least a year, if not more, in prison or jail. Her DA and her judge agree to let her essentially serve her sentence at home, be held accountable, but also get whatever help she needs to make changes for herself and her family. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an even earlier intervention for women who are at risk of going into the system but haven't yet, um, and we get them, you know, generally the help they need, and that the help they need varies, like every woman is different, but the consistent things that we see are, you know, access to health care, especially mental health care, access to substance abuse help, um, and access to education and job training. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you? Um, I know you, you, when you were incarcerated, you had like a huge support system. You had the website, the pipe bomb. Um, what was it like for you to have people sending you those things? And what kind of difference do you think that it made for your experience as opposed to women who don't have that type of support system behind them? Is that like, do you think that has what to do with people who re-enter the system and kind of keep cycling through? as opposed to just going in and then being done. Absolutely. So when we think about what a prisoner or jail does, a prisoner or jail basically banishes someone from the community, right? It's like a form of exile, mm -hmm. right? We send someone out of the community, we separate from them in the community, we put them in a prisoner or jail for whatever the length of their sentence is. Um, and so if you are able to maintain contact with your family, with your friends, with somebody on the outside during that exile who cares about you, who has some kind of a stake in your success and your survival, 
that is very, very powerful, both in practical terms, but also in emotional and mental terms. Mm -hmm. The idea that there are people on the outside who still care about whether you're going to ever come home and whether you're going to come home successfully and will be willing to help you is very, very powerful. Which is why it's important um, to make sure that prisons and jails don't cut those ties. And for far too many people, that is the case. First of all, the longer your sentence is, the more your ties back to the community will be diminished um, frequently. And also, in really practical terms, prisons and jails sometimes have policies that make it harder to maintain those lifelines. So they may cut visiting hours or make it difficult for people to visit. Um, and those visits are very important. Mm -hmm. um, prison phone calls can be prohibitively expensive. And again, the vast majority of people who go into prison or jail come from our poorest communities and families. Right. So um, those prison phone calls are much more expensive than what you and I pay for when we make a cell phone call, exponentially more expensive, like $15 a minute. Um, and then even policies around things like mail Prisons and jails often um, put in place policies that make it possible only to receive a postcard, for example. Like you can't send a prisoner a letter, you can only send them a postcard, or they won't allow you to send books, mm -hmm. or they won't allow you to send um, other reading material. And so those things are very um, wrong-headed and, and ultimately you know, harm people's ability to come back to the community successfully. And we all have a stake in people coming home successfully and safely. Right. Can you, and this was probably the most mind-blowing part of the book for me, how is it legal or acceptable that inmates are paid 14 cents an hour for the work that they do? That's insane. Yeah, so um, when we think about the work that gets done in prisons, of course we think about prison employees, we think about people who are correctional officers or deliver correctional health care or, or you know, um, do other work in the prisons. But the majority of the work that is done to maintain a prison is done by prisoners. And then in addition to that, increasingly, prisoners are sometimes hired out as labor to corporations. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the reason that those corporations want to use that prison labor is because it's much, much cheaper than what they would have to pay somebody who is walking around free in the world. So when we think about like what, what takes away American jobs, there's an irony that American prison labor, which you know is literally pennies on the dollar, is taking jobs away from people on the outside. Um, you know there are some deep connections in America between uh, incarceration and slavery, and yeah, you know, absolutely. It you like can, it. yep, you can read the New Jim Crow, or you can watch the amazing documentary called The Thirteenth, which was just nominated for an Oscar which help, which, you know, both of those explore those connections between free labor, the end, you know, slavery, the end of slavery, and the rise of prisons. There's a really interesting book called Texas Tough, which um, documents the correctional system in Texas, which is one of the biggest and known as one, as the, one of the most punitive. Um, and it really um, grew out of abolition, right, when those enormous um, you know, labor pools were suddenly liberated and recognized as human beings, that's when we saw a significant rise and development of the American penitentiary. Mm -hmm. Because, particularly in the southern states, prisoners were used as you know, chain gang labor and other forms of free labor. Right. And that is still going on today. Yeah, I, I just touched on that. Um, what is your favorite book that you read while you were in prison? I know you did a lot of reading. Oh, yeah. A lot yeah. of people sent you a lot of books. Yeah, prisoners love books, mm -hmm. and books were, you know, totally, they, they totally helped me survive that experience. Um, it, it's hard to pick a favorite. I would say my favorite novel that I read is a novel called Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful book, and it's so interesting. You know, things have really changed a lot when we think about gender and we think about transgender people and so on. Um, from you know, that was back in 2004 that I was incarcerated when that book was published. But it's tremendous. I really loved that book. Um, and for nonfiction, there's a book called Mind Wide Open by Stephen Johnson, I believe, and. 
it talks about sort of how our minds work, like literally how the brain works, and I found that really interesting, yeah. particularly to read it in that setting, right, yeah, where absolutely. you know it, he sort of breaks down things like fight or flight instincts, mm -hmm. which was really relevant. To right. Me. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, um, since you kind of work as an author and as like with TV and stuff, I saw you wrote with a lot of the Orange and Black TV show. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to kind of like convey this message that things are not so great in the present systems, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. how difficult has it been to kind of convey that message using these such large platforms? Well, I think that prisons and jails are very intentionally hidden away from the public view, mm -hmm. right? And so the flip side of that is that we're always curious about things that are sort of hidden from us, right? Sometimes we are and sometimes we're not, but a lot of people are curious. Um, you know, I think, I think the truth of the matter is that people expect prisons and jails to be awful. You know, they expect that, they think that that's part of the punishment, but when you really think through what if it was me, or what if it was someone I loved who did something wrong and was sent to prison? What would I want for that person? Mm -hmm. Suddenly you start to think a little bit differently about the harshness of American punishment and what we really expect of a prisoner or jail, and especially when you think about people coming out of prison in worse shape than they went in, you know, why are we spending all this money and all this time um, making, making more damage to people sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you still keep in contact with any of the women you were incarcerated with? Yes, yes, and I'm happy to say that uh, the vast majority of the women who are depicted in the book are home, good. right? Which is good, home and free, and uh, you know, some people have done tremendously wonderful things, some people have really struggled, of course, yeah. but um, yeah, that makes me happy good. when I hear how folks are doing yeah. that. So you kind of turn probably one of the darkest moments in your life into something that is a really beautiful social platform that's like really working to create real change. Do you have any advice for someone who might find themselves in a situation similar to the one you were in? Uh, how they could kind of turn that around? Yeah. I mean, I think there's always this balance between, you know, self-reliance and the things you have to do, you know, the, the things you have to do to navigate a difficult experience, you know, sort of stand on your own two feet. But to me, the important thing about the experience was the ever-increasing recognition of the fact that it's my connection to the other women who I was incarcerated with, my connection to my family and the other people on the outside who cared about me that truly helped me navigate that experience. And so we never really ultimately benefit from isolating ourselves, from withdrawing into ourselves. I mean, we do have to have a sense of self-reliance, but we also need a really strong sense of connection to others to get through the challenges that we'll inevitably face, each and every one of us faces in our lives.